how much rope length do we need for glacier travel? Let's get into it. Hi there, I'm Jason. How long of rope do I need for my glacier travel rope team? Seems like a simple question, but there is some nuance to it. We want to determine if we need break knots between climbers, how much rope distance we need between climbers, and how much rope to carry in spare coils. First, do we want break knots between climbers and how much rope does that take up? The ENSA, again, the school that teaches mountain guides in Chamonix, did a number of studies on the effectiveness of break knots, and they can be highly effective in the right circumstances. There's a link in the description. Snow depth on top of the glacial ice was key. In tests with 30 centimeters or about a foot of snow depth, they found the knots could not dig into the snow and help arrest a crevasse fall. But in other tests with more than a meter of snow, the break knots would bite into the snow and help stop the falling climber. So for two-person teams, this is highly, highly recommended. And according to members of the German Guide Association, with another link in the description, it may make sense for three-person teams as well. Why wouldn't we do this for all teams? Well, like anything, there are cons. It essentially dictates that your crevasse rescue system use a separate rope, other than the loaded strand, to effect a rescue. The drop loop 6 to 1 that you learn by following the link below to our glacier travel series does this effectively, but you need to carry spare coils to make it work. It also creates small weights in your rope that can hit and bite into the snow just while walking if you aren't careful about slack management. So, some guides like IFMGA guides Mark Chauvin and Rob Capolillo in their book The Mountain Guide Manual, there's another link in the description, recommend it for a party of two and put it in a gray area for a party of three. If you have factors that increase the difficulty of arresting a fall, say a climber that is significantly heavier than the rest, then it may make sense on a three-person team. If we do tie knots, ENSA have a recommended knot as well. They want a knot that is bulky enough to really dig into the snow, and so we start with a figure eight on a bite and then run the bite loop under, around, and back through the top of the knot. Depending on who you talk to, you will see different recommendations for knot spacing and number of knots. ENSA has three meters from an end climber to their first knot, then two meters between knots with three knots total for each climber. Chauvin and Capolillo recommend two meters to the first climber and one meter between knots. What everyone agrees on though, is that we don't want the first knot so close to the climber that it doesn't have a chance to bite into the lip of the crevasse. And we don't want the knots so far apart that they can't work as a unit to create friction. If we add break knots, they really matter when talking about overall rope length. The ENSA recommended knot can take up to about four feet or 120 centimeters of rope per knot. That's over seven meters of your rope taken up by the six knots. This is part of why Chauvin and Capolillo recommend the Alpine butterfly knot as a break knot. It reduces the length of rope used per knot to half that of the ENSA knot, but you obviously lose the bulk, which may reduce the knot's ability to bite. Now let's talk about climber spacing. This is contingent upon crevasse sizes. On a two-person team, we need to make sure the distance between climbers is longer than the width of the crevasses so that both members of the team are not on a snow bridge at the same time. When we get to a three-person team, we are now adding a second climber to a rest to fall. We have more margin for error. So with three people, we can start to bring the climbers closer together and closer still with four people. Why take the risk of bringing climbers closer? Longer rope spacing creates difficulty in traveling the glacier and with communication, making progressing through the terrain significantly more difficult. We'll be talking about the mechanics of moving a team over a glacier in a future video, but we're trading off slightly in favor of an ever-present thing, having to walk on the glacier and talk with each other, as opposed to the rarer thing of a crevasse fall. What all this means is that spacing is contingent, so there is no way to say, this amount of rope all the time. So let's talk about three scenarios to see how we might decide on different rope lengths, factoring in crevasse sizes, team member count, the assumption of a six to one drop loop crevasse system that impacts coil length, and the use of knots as appropriate. Let's take a two person team in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. For climbs in that area, we will often hear guides talk about the 10 minus N guidelines, meaning that you take the number 10 and subtract the number of climbers, in this case two. 
you're left with eight. That means eight double arm spans between climbers, meaning from one end of one outstretched hand across your chest and to the other outstretched hand. Think of it as less than two meters. So we need eight times something less than two meters, or let's say 15 meters between climbers. But if we are adding the ENSA knots, that's six knots taking up seven meters of rope. So we have 15 meters between climbers, but have used 22 meters of rope to make that span because of the knots. We also need each climber to be carrying enough rope coil length to implement the six to one drop loop crevasse rescue system. If you watch our video on this, again, that link is in the description, you know that we need enough extra rope to go back to the other climber and then about halfway back again. So think of needing about 1.5 times the length between climbers. That's 1.5 times 15 or 23 meters. And we want each climber to have those coils. So 23 times two or 46 meters of coil total. Now we add it all up. 46 meters of coil plus 22 meters of rope between climbers reduced to a 16 meter span because of the knots. That's 68. So maybe as much as a 70 meter rope is what is called for. You could reduce this a little if you are willing to add a long sling to the initial drop loop of the crevasse rescue system. Maybe you plan on that and get to a 60 meter rope. There are other considerations as well though, which we'll come to at the end, but for now, another scenario. We are on a three person team in the Alps. Back to our German guide friends who recommend 10 to 12 meters between climbers on a team of three in that part of the world. Taking the maximum is 24 meters. Should we decide to add the brake knots, we still only need two sets, each between the end climber and the middle climber. And with those two sets of knots, we again have seven more meters of rope. We have used up 31 meters in total. But now we get to save rope in the crevasse system because if a climber falls in, we have the middle climber and the distance from them to the other end climber already available for the rescue. So rather than 1.5 times the distance between climbers, we only need to come up with another 0.5 times that length. That's six meters of coil on each end climber or 12 meters of coil in total. With 31 meters of rope and knots and 12 meters of coil, we need 43 meters of rope. Yeah, we end up needing less rope. Another good reason to travel in teams of three rather than two. And our last scenario, a team of four in Alaska, and let's assume big crevasses, roughly 25 meters across. Maybe with four people, we reduce down to 20 meters between each climber. We don't need brake knots either because of the added weight in place to help a rest to fall. So we have 60 meters total between the four climbers. If a climber falls in a crevasse and it is 20 meters to the nearest climber, we have more than enough, 40 meters of rope behind for the rescue system. But I mentioned there might be other considerations. Well, let's just blow this whole thing up a bit. This is all assuming that crevasses that are hard to see due to poor visibility or lots of early season snow cover are our main concern. Just as one counterexample, what if we are late season and the crevasses are visible and plentiful, demanding complex route finding? Maybe we want to be closer to facilitate travel and communication. In the end, all of this is about managing risks and we need to consider our risks in context. Hopefully this video has given you a thought process to help you make rope management determinations for your next glacier ascent. What other risks do you factor into your glacier travel rope team setup? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share if you want to support us. For more information, you can go to our website at www.shortguysbetaworks.com. You can check out that video I mentioned about that six to one drop loop crevasse rescue system, or you can take a look at our entire glacier travel series. We'll see you next week and keep on getting more out of that big outside.